Optimization is an extremely um, important part of uh, this course. So this, this class in particular will be very important. And we're going to rehearse um, everything that's going on here next week in your practical. Um, so let's try to uh, finish this class. So um, very quick background. Suppose you have a function of two variables. Um, so you have a function that depends on the variables theta1 and theta2. And let's assume, for example, that it's this quadratic ball that we've seen before. So in other words, it's a ball like this centered at theta1 and theta2. Then its height is f of theta1 and theta2. Um, we can cut planes and if we cut planes um, and we visualize it from the top we will see circles as our contours. Okay. Now the the derivative, so when you have a function of several variables, um, to compute derivatives, we're sort of going to proceed similarly to what we do with the calculus of in, in 1D. And in, in it's we're going to define the derivative, which I will use the symbol um, nabla, I think it's called. Who's Greek here? Nabla? Thank you. The derivative of theta1 and f2 with respect to, and I will just for simplicity write this as f of theta. So if there's no subindex, I mean the vector. With respect to theta 1, it's going to be, you sort of want to have something like what we had in normal calculus, which is the, the rate of change. But you only want the rate of change along one of the directions. In this case, direction one. Okay. So it's like you have a function of two variables, and you're only exploring it along the direction theta one. So you're moving maybe along this direction here, but not along the direction theta two. And then the derivative is obtained when you look at the infinitesimal rate of change. As, as the interval of exploration uh, goes to zero. Okay, so that's essentially what the partial derivative is. And um, in this case, um, df of theta d theta 1 is going to be equal to 2 times theta 1. And df of theta with respect to theta 2 will be equal to 2 times theta 2. Now, instead of writing all the derivatives one by one, um, we use matrices, so we create a vector that has all the derivatives, and that's what I'm calling a gradient. Um, the gradient is just this vector that will contain both of these derivatives, 2 theta 1 and 2 theta 2. So the gradient contains all the partial derivatives with respect to each <coughs> variable. An interesting thing about this is if you pick a point, for example, theta 1 equal 1 and theta 2 equal 1, and you look at the gradient evaluated at that point, so the gradient of j at theta 1 comma theta 2 will be equal to the vector 2 comma 2. Okay, the gradient's a vector. And that vector is perpendicular to um, the contour, uh, the, the level curves. And you could do, you can do this check at 1 minus 1 and minus 1, minus 1, and if you want to do a bit more work, you do look at the plane that, in, um, that is tangent to the surface, and then define the normal to it, and then um, just basically do a little bit of um, calculus to prove that the gradient is always perpendicular to the tangents of the level curves. 
So that's a basic fact we know from calculus. I'm just revising it here because this is one of the most important things. The gradients indicate the direction of the maximum change. Okay, that's important. If you want to learn fast, you follow the gradient. The gradient points to the steepest uh, descent. and uh, Sorry, the steepest ascent. So if you want to minimize, you, f you go in the opposite direction of the gradient. If you want to maximize, you go in the direction of the gradient. Um, we also, so that's the gradient. We also talk about the Hessian. And so we can compute the derivative with respect to theta 1 of the derivative with respect to theta 1 of f of theta. And for short, we write it as in this form. And in this case, we have 2 theta 1. If you differentiate that with respect to theta 1, you get 2. And likewise, you will find out that the derivative of f of theta with respect to theta 2. Uh, whoops, I didn't mean to write that square there. Uh, yeah, no, actually I did. Um, so that, to indicate the second derivative, that's also equal to 2. The derivative of f of theta with respect to theta 1 and then with respect to theta 2 will always be equal and this is another theorem that we prove in calculus, which I won't prove here. And in this case, it's equal to zero. It's, uh, mainly, if you want to take the derivative with respect to theta one, you get two theta one. If you differentiate then this with respect to theta two, you would get zero. We can put all these derivatives in a matrix. Uh, oops, got the wrong one. And that matrix is called the Hessian. It's the matrix of the second derivatives. In this case, it's a very nice matrix. It will always be a diagonally dominant matrix with all positive eigenvalues <coughs> when you can find a minimum. In this case, we're dealing with a ball. It's uh, well defined. Um, the second derivative, what information does it give you? Pardon? The rate of the change of the gradient, you can use it to check for convexity, which in other words, whether it's a ball like this or a ball like this, or whether it's a saddle point. Um, it also measures curvature. Okay, so if I had, if I had a ball that was more, if I, so I could have a ball that is like this, or I could have a ball that is like this. And so for one, the Hessian will have, be, have a larger diagonal, and for the one, the Hessian will have a lower diagonal. So the, so the Hessian sort of also gives you a lot of information about the curvature of the cost function. That's going to be useful for optimization. So the gradient tells you where to go. The Hessian tells you something about the curvature. Um, Another thing that's going to be useful, uh, background of calculus that we'll use for this course. And if any of these concepts are not clear, then I advise you to uh, Google these um, with the word Wikipedia. Go to Wikipedia and revise these or go to your calculus book and so on. Um, these are what I think are the essential, con essential calculus that you need to have um, to, for us to do optimization. Um, and machine learning. Uh, the chain rule, basically, I'm going to show it just with an example. If you have a function, oops, if you have a function, a variable that is a function of two variables, um, and each variable is in turn a function of two variables. So, uh, so z is a function of x and y, and x and y are both functions of u and v. So one picture sort of to illustrate it is you would have u and v, um, and I guess you would have something like uh, something like this, where you, you could you could have something where you 
you f sort of pass u and v and then you get out x and you get out y and then they get combined and then they produce a signal z. So you can think of it in terms of a signal model where you start with u and v, um, they get combined in a node to produce um, <coughs> x and in another node to produce y and then they get combined in another node and they produce z. So there's this compositionality. The, then the derivative of z with respect to uh, uh, u is, and, and here we sort of uh, um, need to think of uh, rates of change. Um, if you want to know how u depends, how z depends on u, which is what you're looking with the derivative, how by perturbing <coughs> u, you would perturb z. There are two ways in which you could perturb z. You could either perturb from u. You could either perturb it by following this path, or you could perturb it by following this other path. Right? So both, there's two paths to go from u and z. So your derivative um, will capture that. So you will have to compute dz um, dx times dx du and then you have the other path through y. Okay. If you have k paths, then there would be uh, we would we would have to sum k terms. Okay. Um, and this is the um, in Wikipedia you'll find uh, the proof. I think it's there. I'm not sure. If not there, if you Google the uh, the chain rule for multivariable calculus, you will get uh, you will get a proof of this. Uh, we will be using this a lot because what I've drawn here is essentially um, a neural network. A neural network is a compositional function approximation tool and we will be using the chain rule in order to compute derivatives. Um, so here is an example of optimization. We're trying to fit a line to points. We have endpoints. We have a line with uh, intercept theta naught and slope theta one. And then we decided that the kind of cost function we would like to optimize is something like this, like the ridge cost. Um, and if you do this, then the first thing you would want to do is compute the gradient. And the gradient will just be the vector of the two derivatives. So in this case, you would have the sum over i equal 1 to n, the derivative with respect to theta naught, which would be just uh, 2 times yi minus theta naught minus um, theta 1 xi. And then the derivative with respect to theta naught is just minus 1. And then you would have the sum from 1 to n to the same term. Uh, the derivative of theta 1 xi, which would be minus xi, using the chain rule for 1d variables. And then you would have delta squared theta 1. Okay, That's your gradient uh, vector. Oh yeah, I forgot it too. Thank you. Uh, once we have the gradient, um, now we can, uh, we'll just be able to, all we need to do is have a rule that tells us what to do with this gradient. It's the direction of steepest descent, so we should adjust theta naught and theta one in, so that we follow this vector to find the optimum solution. Okay. Um, Let's now try to go from an example to a more general setting. So in a more general setting, um, the gradient will be a vector where we have many parameters. Like if we're doing, trying to fit a model, uh, a linear model with many parameters, um, we will have to form a vector uh, that has all the derivatives. Um, we need to come up with this gradient. And as I mentioned before, like in, in this 1D case, the gradient just gives you this, these vector fields, the pointing out toward the maximum. 
in a quadratic you guarantee to find the optimum. Um, typically the type of cost functions that we will look at, you know, they're more like this. They have many optima. Um, they're not convex and so um, when things are convex you, you can guarantee that you can find the optimum provided that you have um, the right rates of acceleration um, as we'll see in an example soon. But if, if you have multiple optima, you, all you'll be able to guarantee is that you'll hit one of them. And you don't know, you'll never know whether that's the global one or not unless you do some um, uh, mathematics to, to understand what's the probability that, that you've hit an, a global optimum. Um, in practice, you will not be worrying too much about that. You will just try to come up with a opt uh, gradient optimizer that takes you to one mode. Um, when we look at neural networks, we'll see why that is the, why one solution is enough. It will have to do with identifiability. Um, and just like for the simple case, we form the Hessian. Okay, so you should think of the gradients and Hessians as like think of two routines you could have in your code that given any function, you pass the fun a handler to the function and it returns the derivative or it returns the second derivative, the matrices and vectors. And so for, for data, our objective function will always be of this form. It will always involve the data. Because um, essentially, and, and this is sort of an approximation to the expectation of f of theta and x with respect to p of x dx. So if the data uh, is being generated by nature, and nature is, has a distribution p of x, all we're doing is we're computing Monte Carlo estimates. Um, so given a finite set of data, we're maximizing. And the theory of empirical risk minimization, um, as well as uh, statistical uh, tools like the bootstrap, attempt to answer the question of, um, do we have enough data to learn this parameter? Um, we will assume that everything is continuous and smooth enough that we will be able to interchange integrals with derivatives. Um, there are cases where you can't do that, but in this course, for all the type of problems that we deal with, we will be able to do that. And so, by t taking the derivative, we will use linearity, and we'll just take the derivative. The derivative of the cost function is the sum of the derivatives. In some, uh, in torch, you'll find that sometimes you there is variables called accumulated gradient and so on. So the idea there is you're actually computing the gradient at one data point, and then you're adding it to the gradient of that you you know, the accumulated gradient from previous points that you had already computed. So you're computing the sum um, sequentially. Um, now in least squares, you can either write a cost function like this or like this. I've been using this form so far, but this form turns out to be easier to do calculations, um, as I show here, because we've already done this calculation before. We, if we take the derivative of this, quantity using uh, matrix differentiation, um, that gives us the expression for the gradient. So you get the two entries um, in the two when theta is two-dimensional immediately. <coughs> um, so if theta is the dimensional, the gradient is the dimensional, the Hessian is d by d. And if we take the derivative um, once again, and that sort of makes sense because this is d by n, this is n by d, so you get a matrix that's d by d. So the Hessian has got the right sizes. Um, so you can either go with sums or you can do it using matrix um, algebra. It turns out that in torch, uh, sum, doing things iteratively is still used a lot. Um, so the first uh, recipe for learning is to follow, as I mentioned, to go in the opposite direction of, uh, you want to minimize an objective um, so, you, and the gradient is pointing to the maximum, so you go in the opposite direction. So, if we say that GK is the gradient vector, or alternatively, grad F, as we've used in our notation, um, we we start at the theta, and to get the next theta, what we do is we travel in the opposite direction of the uh, gradient, and we travel by an amount. Eta. Okay, so 
as this picture shows, you're at theta k, you want to go to theta k plus 1, and you travel by a, um, a strength eta times the direction of the gradient. Okay, the direction in, in the opposite direction of the gradient, sorry. So the gradient is telling you to go up, you go exactly in the opposite direction, and the gradient is pointing out in direction that is the steepest direction, the most vertical direction, so you pick that direction to get your next feet. And you keep going. And so in a, again, in a parabola, uh, in this paraboloid, it's very, the because the gradients are perpendicular, we're traveling perpendicular to these level curves. So whatever you start, you will get to the minimum. Um, if your function, again, has more than one peak, as will be the case for neural networks, then you're not, depending on where you start, even if you just perturb the initialization by a little bit, you could end up in very different parts of the space. Now, if we use our, exp um, uh, for, so for linear regression, if we compute the gradient, uh, which is this expression that we've seen all the time, then the, the form that the algorithm takes, you just plug that in here. You just plug in the expression for the gradient, whether you're using matrix methods or sums, and that's your algorithm. You initialize theta naught at random, um, and then you just loop over thetas until, until the theta stop changing, and you have your solution, and you're done. You've learned. However, it's not that simple, because you have to choose this guy, eta. And even if your function is convex, even if you're, no, you're, you're guaranteed to find the optimum, if your eta is too small, it's, it's, and it's decaying, say, it's like 1 over n to the 100, something like that, it's decaying too fast, what happens is you become really slow. And unless n goes to infinity, but we don't have infinity time before the PhD people start harassing us to hand in the thesis, um, you're going to be here, and you're going to be far from the optimum. Um, if you decide to get this done quickly and pick a one that's very large, um, remember that the gradient is um, the negative, I guess, of the gradient here is pointing out, it's perpendicular, it's pointing out to the minimum. So if you follow the gradient, you will swing to the side, and then you follow, oops, sorry, and then you follow the gradient again, and you'll swing to the side. Okay, so you'll be able, you essentially will be doing this very slow convergence. You'll be wiggling. So too large a delta will get you in trouble. So there seems to be a, so there's a question here of how we choose this, um, sorry, this eta variable, this learning rate variable. Um, one solution is to use the Hessian. Because in a sense, if we knew the curvature, we took, could use, take advantage of knowing that information. If, if a ball is very peaked, we know we should probably go slow, okay? Because we could swing to the other side very easily, because uh, it's very steep. But if the ball is very wide, well, then we, you know you need a larger eta, because you need to go faster. So knowing the curvature should help you. And that's essentially the intuition for Newton's method. Newton's method uses, as, instead of using the eta uh, to multiply the gradient, it uses the inverse of the Hessian. Okay, so we're going to use the curvature. One way to derive this algorithm is to think of a quadratic approximation. So just like a Taylor series. So we're going to come up with this quadratic approximation to f of theta. And so the Taylor series says that f of theta is f uh, the Taylor series uh, that's trying to approximate f of theta with a quadratic function at theta k is essentially f of theta k plus the first derivative times delta theta and then the second derivative times delta uh, theta squared. And this is essentially what I've written here is the multivariate version of that uh, Taylor series expansion. Now if you differentiate the Taylor series expansion with respect to zero, with respect to theta, so as to find the minimum of that quadratic. So we essentially, we have a cost function f, we're approximating it with this quadratic ball, and then we're gonna find the minimum of the quadratic ball. 
And we differentiate this with respect to theta. The first term, this guy here, does not depend on theta, so the derivative goes to zero. Um, the derivative with respect to theta, just you transpose the vector. That's, that was the rule. And then um, in your next class, I'm going to ask you to do some of these to, to get used to matrix differentiation. And then the derivative with respect to theta here, just hk times theta minus theta k. If you equate that to zero, you get Newton's method. Okay? So Newton's method is what you get when you make a quadratic approximation and you minimize the quadratic. So that's in math and words. The picture is this. Um, you have your function f of theta in red here. And let's assume that you're currently here. You're descending and you're currently at this point. What you do is you fit a quadratic that provides a very good approximation near theta k. It's the typical thing of a Taylor series. Near the point is a good approximation. Far away, it, the error is large. But we don't care about it far away. We just care it about close by. So you approximate it near there. And then you find a minimum of it. In other words, you navigate until you find the minimum of the quadratic. And that is your new theta k. And so Newton's method, really, if you have something that looks like this, all it's doing is fitting quadratics. Uh, well, that's a terrible drawing, but you, you, get, you get the idea. It's fitting quadratics and minimizing quadratics as you go down. So it's upper bound minimization. This is Newton's tree in Cambridge, in case you're wondering what this picture is. And this is one of these was his room. That's in Trinity College. Um, now, now let's put this. Let's see how good is Newton's method. How well would we do if you knew the curvature of the ball? Uh, for linear regression, where we have, where our f of theta is like this. Um, this is the gradient. This is the Hessian. Let's assume we decided to apply this Newton's method. So we would write this. We would have 2x transpose x minus 1 times the gradient minus 2x transpose y plus 2x transpose x theta. And that will give us theta k uh, minus, so minus times a minus will give us a plus, plus um, x transpose x inverse times x transpose y and then minus x transpose x inverse times x transpose x theta and it's the gradient evaluated at k so I should have put a k here okay should it be a 4 no, because there's an inverse here. So the two scans. Okay, so how many steps does Newton take to find a minimum? One. Newton was a very smart guy, just piping in Cambridge. <laughs> right, because this is... The inverse cancel, x transpose x inverse cancels with x transpose x. And then you take theta minus theta cancel, and you get the least square solution. So if you follow the gradients with Newton's method, boom, the answer. Not with the gradient. With the gradient, you need to think about that eat. Even in a quadratic ball, you could be oscillating for a long time, or you could be too sluggish. Good question. For a ball? I mean, if, if, if the step size is too big and you jump within the range of another like minimum, minimum like uh, local minimum, then you could possibly... Like, oh, no, no. But I'm just thinking a quadratic ball. The, the, uh, what happened? Okay. <laughs> I need to think about that. It happens with how you deal with infinity. With, you're going to have to take limits. 
we, we can think about that puzzle afterwards. Um, so one detail about implementation of Newton's method. So essentially the direction of Newton's method, um, so um, uh, we can call this dk, the direction of descent. And that direction um, is given by this term. For gradient would be eta times g, but for Newton's method is this matrix times vector. And so if we look, write it that way, we can multiply both sides by the Hessian, and what we have is a linear system. So in a sense, um, one way to implement Newton's method is you have a function that gives you the gradient, you have a function that gives you the Hessian, you solve this linear system to get the direction of descent, and then you descend, um, uh, oh, hang on, this one I haven't explained to you yet. So let's put a question mark here. And then you descend. So even for Newton's method, we do something called, uh, let's come back to this question mark, we do something <coughs> called line search. So line search is, you, sort of, you can look a few steps ahead, you can sort of do, uh, um, imagine with gradients, it's more intuitive there, you could look a few steps ahead and you see if the arrow went up, then you would backtrack and make eta small. And that's essentially um, what line search is, and there's many ways of implementing this. Um, I'm not going to go into those details. Now coming back to, even with Newton method, as you go and deal with uh, non-convex functions and so on, it's still a good idea to do this. Um, but um, there is a catch with, and, and the reason for doing this step, I should add, I didn't finish my thought there, was um, solving a linear, there's lots of very good techniques out there for solving linear systems. And a lot of those techniques for solving these linear systems, when they involve uh, products of uh, uh, matrices times vectors, can even, those products can even be done implicitly. So there's a lot of very good techniques that um, allow you to solve these systems very efficiently. And so you can take advantage of that. This is conjugate gradient algorithm. And there's a very nice course taught here in mathematics by Nick Trefethen that uh, I think he's teaching it now, that uh, will teach you um, all the theory behind these algorithms. Now, what is the catch with Newton's method compared to gradient to set? The good old steepest descent. No catch. It's more expensive, right? It's more expensive. You now need to store the Hessian. Now, let's go to our neural networks. We have a billion parameters. Now we need to store a billion by a billion. So you tell Google, you can either use a billion cores, or you could use a billion billion cores. And you you know what your manager is going to say. Um, so uh, Newton's method, the cache with Newton's method is to come up with the Hessian. And there's approximations to the Hessian. So people try to come up with approximations. Um, I will talk about one at the end called Ada Grad that's quite effective. And um, But there's other methods. There's things called BFGS. Uh, LBFGS is a common method that you'll find in Torch. Um, it's very popular. It does can do some line search, um, and it's basically it builds an estimate of the Hessian based on the last uh, few observations. Hence, why it's called limited. It sort of has a limited memory uh, over which it builds the Hessian. So those methods sort of implement um, heuristics, shall we say, to approximate the Hessian. Uh, but some of them are quite effective in practice. LBFGS is one that I like. Um, However, all these methods so far assume that we actually looked at all the data and then we took a step. A pass through all the data is called an epoch um, in the language of neural networks, in the torch language. Uh, a pass through all the data is an epoch. But what if your data is streaming? Okay, it's Twitter data <laughs> coming at you. you. You can't pass through all the data. Or in another case, you, you might have so much data this idea that you're going to load the data to RAM, like forget about it. It's not going to fit in RAM. It's not going to fit in your computer. So you're going to have to look, go over the data ch by chunks. You load a bit and you go over it. Or as we'll see at the end, 
if you have several machines, different machines could be loaded different chunks of data. So we need a, a, a way of going through the data in an online manner and um, that takes us to stochastic gradient ascent. And it's stochastic because you'll only have seen a little bit of the data. So there's uncertainty about what other data is out there. And it goes as follows. You want to compute a gradient of some objective function that you're optimizing, say the quadratic for least squares. And as we just mentioned, what you're trying to, comp what you're really doing is you're computing the gradient with respect to theta. Of, of a gradient that depends on the date. And you're taking its expectation over x, you're integrating over x to eliminate the effect of, to marginalize the effect of x. And then what we do is we approximate it by drawing samples from PFX. So what I'm going to do next, and what we want is the sort of gradient to become zero, to vanish. Because where the grade, where the slope is zero, you sort of hit the optimum. And let's for now not worry about saddle points. Um, one way to um, derive SGD is very, and it's sort of, it's, it's, it's the way you would derive a lot of, a, a large class of algorithms called stochastic approximations is as follows. We start with this guy here and let's just call it the, expect, the expectation of f of x comma theta of the grad f of x comma theta and I'm not writing what the expectation with respect to P, uh, the data p of x and the gradients with respect to theta and so we could say that that expectation grad f of x comma theta is equal, we want it to be equal to zero. Uh, I'm going to multiply both sides by eta. Okay. And I'm going to add theta to both sides. So I haven't changed anything. And then I'm just going to introduce indices. And I'm going to say that theta k, oops, I forgot the eta. I'm going to move this term to the other side. And I'm going to say that <coughs> theta k plus 1 is going to be equal to theta k um, minus eta, the expectation of grad f of x comma theta. Now, if we drew samples from P of X, then you could approximate this as theta K minus eta, one over N, sum from I equal one to N, grad F of X I comma theta. That's essentially the batch method that we had before. If your data set consists of N points, this is exactly what our gradient looked like before. Um, but then what folks realized is if you're doing many iterations, you actually can do the following approximation. You only draw one sum. And one sample is enough to give you convergence. Intuitively, it's wasteful to use a lot of data to get approximation of the gradient initially when you haven't learned much at the initial stages of learning. So it's best to just learn as you gather data. Be much more aggressive and, and as you're going down. Another way to look at this is to analyze this a little bit more carefully and to realize that what this is saying is that theta k plus 1 is equal to theta k and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add to this the true gradient and so I'm going to add and subtract it so I get minus eta the expectation of the true gradient I'm just going to write it like this 
so of x and theta and I'm gonna subtract it so I'm gonna minus grad f at x k and theta k. Uh, apologies for going a bit over. Close the bracket. So basically I'm taking the equation at the bottom, I'm adding to it the true gradient and I'm subtracting it. And if you do that then you realize that this is what we want, this is the true, this is the same as the initial equation that we had here, the true gradient. And then this other term is the difference between the true gradient and the gradient with only one term. So this is a form of noise. Okay. So that's going to be changing over time. So you can think of it, and that's why we think of it stochastic gradient descent, because it has this noise term. It's gradient descent, but it, on the true objective, if you knew all the data, but it has this extra noise term because we only observe one data point at a time. Or you might observe only a small batch of data at a time. Um, if you make this guy be equal to 1 over n, or 1 over k with iterations, then this tends to behave very nicely um, for if you had, say, infinite data, if you were going to infinity. Because the series of 1 over k diverges, that means you can this theta would never get sluggish. It would be able to visit the whole space and it will eventually find a minimum. Um, and the noise has some variance that you need to bound and the series of... Um, if, if you think of this as a noise, when you multiply noise by a constant, it's like squaring the variance, uh, multiplying the variance by a constant squared. But the series of 1 over uh, k squared uh, converges. And so the variance is finite, but you can go everywhere in the space. So in other words, you don't oscillate. And yet you can get there. And this is sort of the arguments the theorists use to prove convergence of this. And you can also just sort of map this to differential equation and you can study that it's convergence. So there's a whole field of study out there called stochastic approximation that is dedicated to these problems. Um, for us, it's the important thing is to understand that the noise here is coming from the fact that we haven't seen all the data and that in order to compute um, uh, this online, we only need to load a few data points at a time and that there are people out there who figure out that this scheme can converge. In fact, if we use a constant value for eta, this would still converge. Um, if you have a finite amount of time, you know the number of iterations you're going to run for. So there's three ways in which you could run gradient descent. You could load the whole data. This is called the batch way. Um, you could go one data point at a time. Or you could do what we always do in practice. We, you use um, this thing here called a mini batch. You pick a subset of points, in this case 20. And so if your data has 100 points, you would break it into five groups of 20 points. And you compute a gradient for 20 points and then you take an update of the parameters and then you load the next 20 and so on. That's what we always do um, in practice. In your next practical I'm going to try to get you to implement each of these different ways and see how it behaves as you change the mini batch size. So that's an exercise I recommend. Um, now what you find, sorry. For the, for the previous slide, for the batch case, why would there still be iteration for, for, for or you have all the data, so it's um, you might have all the data, uh, so in which case you know the objective uh, function, but you still um, you started your theta at some particular point, and you still need to go downhill to to find out what the theta should be. So you might have all it's so it's like back to the least square. So we started at a random point. But unless you use, if you use neutral method, you can get there in one step. Uh, but it's true that in least squares, you kind of can get there in one step because we know the optimal solution. Um, but if you have any sort of function that um, has sort of multiple solutions, um, 
that is non-convex, then you, um, you're going to have to descend on theta. Even, even if you know x, you might know x, but you don't know theta. So you guess a theta, and then you keep updating your theta until that theta minimizes a cost function. In the stochastic case, um, it's always important to plot the training error curve to show the error as you go down. And in fact, I forgot to mention this, but this is extremely important. You would also plot the test. One, one thing I recommend is break the data into two sets and then look at how the error is going down on the training set but also look at how it's going down on the test set. Because often what happens is you, you, you're going down on the, well on the training set, but on the test set your error starts increasing. So in that case you're overfitting. So a good technique to prevent overfitting is always plot both curves and watch for this. And when you get here, stop. And this is called the early stopping. This is a difference between learning and optimization. In optimization, you care about finding minimum objective function. But in learning, don't forget that what we're doing here is trying to make good predictions. So always remember to look at your, do your cross-validation. And you can do cross-validation during the training. And of course, the error can go up because it hasn't seen all the data. Um, at Google, um, this is how this gets implemented. Um, the parameter, so first of all, imagine that the parameter lives in a server. Okay, so this parameter is really huge. It's lots of numbers, lots of bytes. Um, then we're going to create model uh, replicas of the model, of the neural network. And so step one is a replica, like uh, one, of, uh, uh, one of the local models that has access to uh, local data, um, I forget the word, server and slave is what I remember, master slave, <laughs> you know, these guys. <laughs> Blue guys ask for a copy of the parameters. They have access to a local amount of data, just a subset of the data, because there's just too much data to load it into a single machine. And then they compute a gradient, they compute a mini-batch gradient, and then they send this mini-batch uh, so the second step would be here, compute the mini batch, and then the third step is they send the update of the gradient, and Jeff uses delta instead of uh, the other way around, uh, instead of the nabla. And so you, you send the update of the gradient back to the server, and then the server, once it receives that gradient, it updates the parameters using that uh, gradient that was sent. The nice thing is you can do this asynchronously. They don't need to be in, the machines need to be in lock um, to, to, for this to work, because you're just summing gradients, so it doesn't matter which term you sum first. Um, one further thing um, that is done is that if you have a very large neural network, you bracket, so each edge here is sort of a parameter of this network, you bracket into groups, so there's four blue boxes, that's essentially what's shown here. Um, and now these four blue boxes actually only do local updates and it's only the things that cross machines like these dark edges that you actually need to communicate. So you also, there's some good methods out there also like called Hogwild and so on that for some models that have sparsity try to exploit this um, to do a completely asynchronous. So you try to get two things. You try to get data parallelism by breaking the data into different regions and you try to create model parallelism by breaking the model in, in this parameter server. Like these days to train very large models, there's not what you're going to do in your computer at all, obviously. But if you're going to join a company and you're going to work training large models, you're going to be using a platform like this. Um, okay, there's a few more tricks that are used to train uh, neural networks, a few more optimization tricks. One is averaging. So the idea is you take an update of your parameters, in this case I've called them um, W, um, and then you average the parameters. Okay. And this is just a running average of the parameters. You can confirm that um, this is just the average. 
uh, 1 over t plus 1 sum over i w i. So you sum your average order parameters and and what intuitively the reason why this helps is imagine that you pick a very large step size and you're oscillating. Then you pick the average and you're, you're right there. So that's the sort of situation where this would work well. Um, and there's a lot of theory behind this as well. And this is actually a sensible trick. Another trick that you, oh, um, I was going to run by you is momentum. And for those of you who've done the practical, you've already seen that this is one of the things you need to choose in your code. Um, so I got this picture from Jeff. It's kind of nice. He, he draws this, this function that looks like this. So it's, it's like this. And so what happens is that if you're following the gradients, you could be doing this. You know? So it's going to take a long time for you to get done. So you're going to be sort of w uh, going around. And so it would be nice to use the momentum, um, or the, in this case it would be, the, I guess, if you, of this particle to accelerate it to go down. So if it's gone a bit down, the gravity sort of try to accelerate it. So we want a trajectory like this as opposed to like this. And so what is done is... Uh, the following thing. You add, introduce a new parameter alpha. <coughs> and then the rest is the usual gradient. Uh, and so, so now your descent will have this extra term that is sort of essentially looking at the, at the rate of is essentially what you're comparing um, let me move this to the side and write it like this you're looking at your delta t plus 1 and this is your delta theta t so the rate of acceleration now sort of depends on what the previous rate of acceleration was so you're not just like going at constant speed but now you can actually accelerate um, because you're using this extra acceleration term. So you get a better convergence to the middle. So momentum is very useful. Um, another thing that's extremely useful is this trick called Adagrad. And Adagrad is based on the following observation, that some data points uh, often, like you have these sort of uh, three inputs in this case, and some inputs really like these green guys and these red guys they're the ones that are really determining what the output should be so very rare things are important whereas very common things uh, are, um, are not very uh, useful and and that's essentially what happens in language you know it's like you want to try to predict what an article is about the rare words are often very informative about what the article is about the common words like the and is and of, they're useless. And so John Ducci and colleagues used this intuition to develop an algorithm that basically um, exploits this. That looks at, so what, what he does is he accumulates um, the gradients. So you, you basically now start looking at the history of how much it changed, how much a sample changed the loss. And so you build a history. Think of it as like uh, one way to think about it this is as well as like an approximation of the Hessian. Um, um, so that only the more, the sort of the rare uh, terms, the rare uh, features um, are able to influence, are able to get um, a larger update uh, for, the, uh, for the parameters. So rarer features will become more important than, um, than common features. Um, this is extremely useful because in um, typically in da data sparse of this nature there's just a there's just a few features that are important so if you have a model like a brain um, you would want that brain to only fire for very few si each neuron in that brain to only fire for a very few signals 
Because if you have a neuron that fires for everything, that neuron is useless. It's not just it's not selecting anything. If I have a neuron that fires only when I smell coffee or see coffee and so on, that, that neuron is useful. It says something about the world. So so you want models that are very sparse in that sense. Um, and so if you have sparse models, you, you want to have optimization methods that handle that well. And this is a brilliant optimization technique. So what's G here? Oh, G is the gradient. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, um, I was looking at the clock and I'm worried because you guys probably want to go home. Um, it's the gradient. And so what you do is you just arrive by the sum of the gradient. So you keep, you keep a tally of your gradients. Um, and so you normalize by all the changes that happened um, along that, that follow, along that feature dimension in the past. How did the, um, the cost change as a result of updating that feature? Now, um, so that's one good technique, and then there's a lot more that I haven't covered. Um, when you play with neural networks, definitely always try this technique. It's very useful. And a synchronous, then in your case, I guess, synchronous, stochastic gradient descent is also very useful with momentum, poly averaging. That's what you're going to be playing with uh, when you're training neural networks. Of course, there's a lot more to optimization that I cannot possibly cover in this short um, 50 minutes. Um, and you and I recommend you go to some, one of the courses that is offered here, like Victor Fethon's course. Um, there is something called Nesterov's Accelerated Method. Nesterov has a beautiful book on this, which for anyone doing machine learning seriously, this is a must read. Um, um, I love Bert Seca's many books. He calls things nonlinear programming instead of optimization, and he has some old books on parallel computation and so on that are extremely good. Um, natural gradients are very nice things, where you look at gradients not in terms of um, parameters, but in terms of the distributions, of, say the likelihoods and so on. Um, so it's it's a very nice way of optimizing. Um, there's a lot of tricks on how to do. Um, if you know that the Hessian only appears as a Hessian vector, you actually never need to form the Hessian. And so there's a lot of very good tricks that exploit that, um, called Hessian free optimization methods and so on. Um, there's a whole topic of optimization with constraints and so on that I didn't touch at all on. Um, so for all that, I would recommend that you go and look at this. For us, for deep learning, what's going to matter is online, mini batch, gradient ascent, uh, online, you know, stoc SGD, and you will care also about improvements to S SGD like Ada Grad, polyac averaging, and momentum. Provided you get a good feel for those uh, techniques, you'll be able to train the big models because that's what folks do out there. All right, so next week, logistic regression and neural networks. So I don't get an applause today. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs>